Welcome to the Win Make Give podcast, ladies and gentlemen. You're not going to believe this, but this is episode 100. Woo! Yoo-hoo! Yeah, like a Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. You know why it's a Benjamin Franklin, Bob Stewart? I'm going to guess that he's the guy on the hundred. I don't see He's the guy on the hundo. Yeah. Bob the doesn't hundo. see too many of those. No, so no. Bob doesn't. only deals in ones. He's married. <laughs> he gets them doled out in lunch money increments. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 100th episode hey. of the Win Make Give podcast, and we are super excited on caffeine, crack, ice cream, Diet Coke. We are amped up and ready to rock and roll. And we are going to take, just like Back to the Future, with our dual flux capacitator, we're going to take a journey through time. I feel like we should insert some late night love songs. What? Some smooth, How'd we get to smooth, that? Smooth jazz. <laughs> like that, that kind of that music kind of intro of just kind of warming us up, getting us in the mood. Chad Himes, why don't you start us off and, and pick an episode and let's talk about what we learn on these earlier episodes of the Win Make Give podcast. <laughs> well, thanks, Ben. You know, it's a... Uh... It's been a blast doing the first, well, 99 as we get to 100 here. And we do want to take a look back at some of the ahas that really have jumped out at us. Ben, early on, episode number five, way back near the beginning. Back when I was tall, tan, and skinny. <laughs> okay, I'll give you those, some of them maybe. Uh, we talked about the fiduciary duties of a leader, and you gave us three fiduciary duties of a leader. Remind our audience what those were. Yeah, the fiduciary duties of a leader is a, is a simple... Uh, list that I came up with where I could ask myself, am I doing the right thing as a leader? Very simple. Did I clearly set the expectations, standards for what somebody has to do to succeed in their role? Number two, did I inspect what I expect? Was I holding those people accountable and making sure that I was a part of their journey from day one on? And number three, did I provide them the training, coaching, mentoring, or resources to succeed in whatever their the role is. And what we talked about in the podcast was if we don't do those three things, that person's failure in the role is my fault as the leader, not the employees. Yeah. I thought that was a really, really powerful one early on. I know you've lived by those for a, a long time now, which has really developed your leadership. Gang, we're going to point you in the direction of episode five to hear a lot more into that conversation. And that's what we're going to be doing today on this episode. We want to take a look back through many of our episodes, some recent, some really near the beginning, and remind you of some of our takeaways, what Bob and I heard or what Ben even got out of some of the interviews and conversations that have happened so that we can tease you back to some of the episodes you've missed. So, Ben, one of our first interviews, one of our first interviews was we brought on David Goggins. I was going to ask you if you if you remembered episode seven. Yeah, and... Wow. I mean, I think Bob's takeaway from that might be that he was doing push-ups just before the interview started, just yeah. watching him. Yeah, not that listen. guy is super intense. Yeah, you know, we interviewed David Goggins before I think everybody in the world knew David Goggins. Not not on this podcast, but we flew him out here to to hang out at, at our live Win Make Give event. And I was just so impressed and motivated by his story. Like, I didn't start running right away, but, you know, I was motivated. And I of one lesson that I learned... You know, David tells the story about how he, in order to get into the to the Navy, I think it was, uh, he had to lose 80 pounds. Right. And he didn't walk in and, and write 80 pounds on a piece of paper or whatever. He walked in and he wrote one pound because he realized that if he couldn't lose one pound, 80 was never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And every day he kept that one pound on his mirror until he lost it. Then he would take it down and he would replace it with the new number until he actually got there. And what a cool lesson that is. To, to break things down into incremental wins, right? You, and we talked about it in the Wealth Series, which we'll talk about today. If you can't save a dollar, you aren't going to save 10. If you can't save 10, you aren't going to save 100, 1,000, million, and, and, and so on. You he, know, he lived that, though, Ben, that, you know, that, that philosophy for him, because he, he talked later about he runs these crazy ultra marathons, right? Like, I don't even, 150 miles or whatever. And he talked about running the very first one and how, he got into this place where he was like, I don't think I can go 128 more miles, you know, but he's like, it was just one more step. He's like, I could always take one more step, right? Or I could always run a quarter of a mile. So that, that incremental improvements or like I can incrementally just do that next thing. That guy is like just living proof that that's a strategy that that's super powerful. You know, I, I interviewed a guy funny enough last night and he's an ultra marathon runner. 
and he had reached out to our company. He actually saw the uh, interview we did with David on episode seven and said, you know what? I was running a race in the middle of Utah desert up in the mountains somewhere, uh, and David was running it. And he started off in the beginning, you know, ahead of everybody, and something happened, and he ended up leaving and having to go to the hospital. And he got out of the hospital, and he came back, and he just finished the race. Of course. Like, he was disqualified. Like, there was no point in finishing it. But to him, he had to finish it, right? It just showed back up and did it. That's and awesome. that, that's that mental toughness, right? right? If you want to learn about men- mental toughness, don't study Bob no. or Chad no. or Ben. <laughs> like, no. like, no, uh, study, study our friend David. You know, that's a common theme, that small changes that you guys were just talking about. I can go another step, quarter mile. David talked about it wasn't 80 pounds. It was one pound. We see that showing up in a lot of our episodes. Uh, We just did an interview with David Nurse, a two-partner. He kept talking about just that 1% change, right? We kept hearing that, just that 1% change. So that's one of those things you talked about in the wealth. If you can't save a dollar, you're not going to save two. You can't, right? We That common theme I found through through many of our episodes is that it's not massive changes. It's going to be minor changes that lead to the massive change. Bob, how about you? Give me a, give me something, an episode that stuck out to you in our journey so far. Well, and maybe this is because I'm, I've in, at times in my life been well short on this. I really liked, I guess it would have been episodes 12 through 16. And it was the first time we ever kind of explored a series, but this was a series around emotional intelligence. And I think so much of, of our success in our personal lives, in our business lives can really be attributed to like, to our emotional intelligence. And, and what does that even mean? So Ben, as you know, we talked about being self-aware and, and self-regulating and, and how to motivate people and showing empathy and social skills. But why do you think that emotional intelligence is, why was it something you wanted to explore? And, and why does increasing our emotional intelligence ultimately make us a, a better partner, a better, a better spouse, a better, you know, just a better human? You know, I was walking through the SeaTac airport, I think, when I first walked across this bright blue book uh, by HBR, the Harvard Business Review, and the topic was emotional intelligence. And I've never like thought I was a super bright man. So if I could find a different way to show up on some sort of intelligence list, like I'm going to bite on it. So (laughs) I I pick up the book and I'm like, hey, am I emotionally intelligent? Right. And I started reading it and I took a picture and I have the picture on my phone right now. and, And it said that when, when companies embrace improving emotional intelligence, they outperform other companies by over 20%. Hmm. In fact, they broke it down and they talked about uh, the the different emotional intelligence skills. And we'll go through them real quick. And these are episodes, what? 12 through 16. 12 through 16. So quite a few. They're pretty short, you know, 15, 20 minutes, but they're good. Uh, Number one, self-awareness. Knowing one's strengths, weaknesses, drives, values and impacts on others are are we a self-aware individual number two self-regulation controlling or redirecting our disruptive impulses and moods and uh if i was just going to give my cohorts a score here they score really low on (laughs) self-regulation because they are incredibly moody and disruptive with their impulsive things they yell at me all day uh, number three, motivation, relishing achievement for its own stake. Number four, and it's a powerful one. We, this this word probably showed up in more episodes uh, than any other word except for like leadership and wealth or something, right? Uh, empathy, mm-hmm. understanding other people's emotional makeup and how, how we affect them. And lastly, social skills, the ability to build rapport with others and move them in desired directions. Now we jumped into a lot of these topics and empathy episode, Chad, and and the building rapport. We actually did, I don't know, is it an eight or nine part series uh, on influence and persuasion yes. that, that dove into the ability to build rapport and relationships quickly. That was a a, a lot of fun for me to to record that series. Can you guys think of any takeaways from the influence and persuasion series well bob i think you're a great person right? <laughs> <laughs> don't try that bull- oh. yes on me you know I-, I love the influence and persuasion series and and that was episode 66 through 73 now you can also go to winmakegive.com 
because we have our series broken down right on the website for you. So you could go there, go to winmakegive.com, and you can find under our series, our Influence and Persuasion series, our Emotional Intelligence series, and of course, the Wealth series. You know, one of the things I love, Ben, is as we talked about all those things in the Influence and Persuasion was you did that body language and those cold reading tips for us. Mm, and, yeah. and I thought, you know, the book is powerful. Probably one of the best books we've gone through in a while as we were talking about all of these different areas. But I thought it was the body language and the cold reading we were able to add at the end, which were really, really nice touches to, to go on top of everything else as we're learning. Bob, what came from influence and persuasion for you? I think there was two. All of these are really, really strong subject matters to, to explore and to, to get better in. I like the consistency. That one to me just shows up so much, right? It shows up in leadership. And I look at Ben, he's just an amazingly consistent guy. And it makes me want to, you know, want to work harder and, and be a part of this organization because of his consistency. But I think about that, you know, in our business, when we're talking about lead conversion and different things and, and getting the people to want to work with us like that consistency is such a big deal. And then liking, I was kind of, I don't know. I mean, this, this is like ridiculous. I always thought I was a likable enough person, you know, but I've done, there's been a few things, Ben, we're constantly recruiting people into our organization and you've got a particular arm of the business that I spend time kind of talking to these people as they're thinking about coming on board with us. And I've taken certain tactics out of, out of this and really started using those. I'll go in and research people in advance and go on their Facebook and try to find some commonalities between us. And the last lady, we were both born in the same city, like small world. But uh, so just there are so many good tactics in here to, to make you a better salesperson, a better leader, a better influencer of people. I'm using these tactics on my three and four year old. Uh, I mean, the, the, these things are, there's really strong content in that, you know, 60, you, like 60. Like the reciprocity, like if you don't pee on the bed, <laughs> I, will, I will give you a popsicle. <laughs> there right. is a story behind That's that. Right. But Bob, you might be using it on your kids. You can be sure your wife's using it on you. Yeah, yeah. She's so. she's uh, highly emotional, intelligent, and, and very persuasive. She's been using it on me long before she ever listened to these podcasts. That's for sure. You know, that was that was kind of a fun thing about doing that particular influence and persuasion series is you get to realize like how these can be tools for good and tools for evil or <laughs> things used by tools in general. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and, and these sort of things that were marketed to all the time, we're sold, we're persuaded. We got politicians screwing up the world, like all these things, right? And then you start understanding, ah, See what they're doing there. Yep. Right. I'm being influenced and persuaded That's right. by this person. Go watch The Social Dilemma, right? Right. And we talked about some books. And one book I want to bring up because it's going to then lead to another episode. And we talked about some leadership books in episode 61. And, and the one I'm going to mention was written by, by a friend of ours, Clint Swindoll. Mm. Uh, Tell me something good. Right. Where we talked about engagement of people and people that are engaged. Your oh yeahs, your oh nos, your okays that are with your organization. And how Clint has really changed a lot of people who have been listening to his podcast or have read his books that tell me something good concept, not, hey, how's it going? Because naturally we know people are going to complain. Now, Clint's also brought two other things to, to our conversation. One, there was a, a statistic about thoughts. Do you remember the statistic about thoughts that we shared a few times? He says a certain number of thoughts go through our head every day. Do you remember how many it is? Uh, 60,000 or yeah, something? Yeah, and do you remember the percentage of how many of them are negative? 80 or 90 percent. And how many of those we had yesterday as well? Another 80 or 90 percent or 50 yeah. percent. It's massive, right? Right. We continue to have the same negative thoughts about ourselves and about our life and about our world every single day. It's like living in that, what was that horrible movie with the Groundhog, Groundhog, Groundhog Day? day. Yeah. Like living in Groundhog's Day every single day of our life. You know what? You know, Clint is one of those guys. He just he's just putting out a brand new book, so you guys should go go order that and check that out. Uh, Clint Swindoll. Uh, Come on, tell he, me you're going to mention episode 21. He is so funny, uh, and he's such a great leadership coach and mentor. In, in episode 21, yep. he he talked about be careful you don't fall into the butthole. <laughs> And when he first introduced this topic to us, there was a room of four or 500 people that we, we had Clint come out and speak to our friends and our, our people in our companies. And he said, you got to be careful that you don't fall into the butthole <laughs> and trying not to blush. I'm like, I don't know if I've done that. What did I do? <laughs> right? And he says, well, here's what happens. Somebody comes up to you and, and you say, well, how's your day? And they say, it's good. 
but you never know. There's a lot of it left. Like, like but you never know. Yep. Well, how, how's, how's the... How's the business? It's good now, but things are going to... Like, everybody falls into this butthole. They try to put this additional negative layer on everything. And what's so cool about lessons and leaders and things like that, like what Clint does, is he simplifies it down to a statement where you walk by and you're like, Bob, quit falling into the butthole. Chad, tell me something good, right? And that's Clint's gift to the world is simplifying things that we remember them so well. Yeah, so we had an interview with you and him on episode 21 where that butthole conversation came up, as did some other things. And then on episode 61, when we were looking at some leadership books, that's where we looked at in uh, his engaged leadership book. Bob, you had a book that really jumped out at you when we were talking about those leadership books, and that was the captain class we talked about on that. What do you remember about that one? I guess the thing I like about that, it, it, it lays out the qualities. So it's, it's about these, these superstar, these uh, franchise teams, right? These teams, the dynasty teams, they won lots of titles over a long period of time. And, and he studied them. And what he what ended up finding out is it wasn't because of the star player that these, that these teams won multiple titles. It was because of the, the, the captain and the the attributes of that captain. And he lays out very clearly in there certain things that like, there's one that always sticks out to me. It's plays by the rules, but in the gray areas, mm-hmm. right? Like I was definitely that basketball guy that would try to get a little advantage by grabbing your shorts a little bit to, to you know, <laughs> to, to move you out of the way. Like um, th- there's something to me that really resonated about that book and, and how he just analyzes, you know, what these, the Tim Duncans and the Bill Russells and, and some of these just great captains of these dynasties, you know, the the skills that they had and what they brought to the table. I love that plane in the gray areas one. Um, but but that is a, a really, really great book. Again, Sam, we had Sam the Walker, of, the author of yeah. that book, you know, spent years and years uh, as the editor of one of the largest newspapers in the world, specifically the sports section. Mm-hmm. And he woke up one day and he had a question, which I love because that's what creates a lot of companies, products, and things. He had a question that said, what makes the most winningest teams in the world in history win continually time after time? Mm -hmm. And our assumption, you know, probably after watching the Michael Jordan series this year, it's like it's the star player. And he went off to prove time and time again it was not the star player that made the most winningest teams in history. It was the captain. It was the person out there, understated, that you probably wouldn't even know their name, that led those teams to win year after year after year, regardless of who 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 the star player was. Yeah, and that was a huge huge lesson for me. And Sam Walker, another great guy that's come out to our events and spoken to our people, and a fabulous uh, writer. You guys should read his Captain Class book. And the reason sure. I like that though is, it, m- most of the time we're looking for the star player. Right. And and you may pass up a, a some talent for your organization because you don't you can't identify the captain class. Yeah. Yeah. You know, another guy that, that you went and found for our podcast who we've heard speak multiple times was Kevin Carroll. Oh gosh, yes. What was your takeaway from from Kevin? Uh, to me, it was that we're always having fun. I mean, Kevin, you know, he's known as the red rubber ball guy for those who who might not recognize his name or didn't listen to episode 64 when we talked to him. Uh, But Bob and I had a great opportunity to talk with Kevin. And boy, he just had so much fun in everything that he did. I mean, he was nicknamed the mayor of Nike. Yeah. Right. From all his time working there, he knew everyone, always had fun. He was telling us the story about like the three-year-olds on his street that wanted to show him his Lego projects and stuff because Kevin just insisted on having fun in everything that he did. But but around community, yes. right? He's the mayor at Nike because he he literally worked at Nike and kind of built the culture of community inside of Nike. I mean, he actually inspired me. I try when I come up in here to Bellingham, and we don't have as many people in our building these days, right? We 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 still allowing people to work from home if they if they choose. But he actually inspired me that I go and I purposely seek out two or three people on you know in, in the the support the operations side of our business and go just try to like build community with them, right? Like make them feel like they're a, a bigger part of a, the company than than they might've felt before I went and had that conversation with him. So I loved uh, the stuff that he talked about around community. I just thought it was really, really important. You know, we 
not only did we I- introduce and find a lot of great people uh, on our podcast, we also studied a lot of great companies. Mm-hmm. And I've never been so mad at you guys as I was when I found out <laughs> that on episode 79, <laughs> you guys recorded an episode about ice cream. Yes, we did. And about you ice your name in it. Ice cream is my love language. Like, <laughs> you don't get a body like this I thought not hitting the Ben and Jerry's up every once in a while for a little snack. Yeah, and I know my takeaway from that, and I was amazed we were doing the research on it, that they literally, they created cookie dough ice cream. I mean, Ben and Jerry's are responsible for that flavor. But Chad, if you remember, it was actually a suggestion that one of their customers left right. them. It was, and the reason that Ben and Jerry's makes their ice cream a certain way is is one of the guys, I don't remember off the top of my head right now, and you'll have to go back and check the episode, but one of the guys actually did not have good taste. He had COVID before it was cool to have COVID. <laughs> lost, his, <laughs> lost his taste. I, I guess, up. and that's why they had to make big chunks of everything. What do you, what do you remember? I mean, I th- you're right that one, they created that, what, and it came from someone else, but what else do you remember what about What made them? them successful? Do you, do you remember? I think what made them successful is they they took um, and we've seen we saw this with Dave's bread guy. They yep. took something that everybody loves and they made it even more lovable. They innovated on this thing that was just it was in every freezer in the United States, right? Like it it, it was everywhere, but they perfected it. They innovated on it. I, I think ultimately that's what why Ben and Jerry's was became who they were. The other cool thing they did is. And look, I don't know when this word would have became kind of a buzzword. They they were guerrilla marketers, right? These guys they sure were. They, they 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 built a bus and they traveled around the country giving free ice cream scoops away. Like um, that that guerrilla marketing style that they that they you know, that approach that they took, and then just literally like the quality of their ice cream, right? That the innovation in in the ice cream was in the quality, was in the chunks, was in these big bold flavors. Um, and these, you know, these different and styles the sources, of ice cream. the sources that they brought everything from, they locally sourced or or healthily sourced yeah. everything. You know, that leads me to another aha. And I can't give a specific episode because, well, when we looked at McDonald's, when we looked at Starbucks, when we looked at Dave, uh, Dave Dahl from Dave's Killer Breads, when we looked at Ben and Jerry's, the, none of them invented anything new. And they weren't even the first person. I mean, when you looked at McDonald's and we talked about Ray Kroc, he wasn't the original creator. And when we looked at Starbucks, he wasn't the guy who originally built the company that you don't always have to be the first. There's always the opportunity. Dave didn't invent bread. Ben and Jerry's didn't invent ice cream. They just took something and made it better. Yeah, the Dave Dave's Killer Bread uh, episode with Dave Dahl was, was, was super good. One of my favorite episodes to record this entire time was the McDonald's story. Mm-hmm. You kind of mentioned it. I don't know what episodes they were. You'll you'll ninety one and ninety two, and you you love them because we talked about hamburgers. <clears throat> I do love cheeseburgers, but just the story, just the story of failure and success, and how it took somebody different to do it. But the story I love the most was the second episode of the series, which was about Den Fujita, mm-hmm. the gentleman who launched McDonald's in Japan. Right. And if you didn't listen to that episode, I I strongly encourage you to do that. He was an impressive individual. Like he launched a restaurant from scratch, not a nail in the ground yet, in 36 hours. That was amazing. That's all he had was 36 hours. And then, you know, the next week he he launches another one. And then he launches the one the day after that. And you built an empire of thousands and thousands of McDonald's all across Japan to an extent that a group of you, you, we'll call them Boy Scouts, whatever That's that right, version yeah. is there, right? Came to America and said, oh, I didn't know that, that you had McDonald's here uh, as well. Like they quote. just believed that it, that, it, that it started there. The story of McDonald's and Dave's Killer Bread and Ben and & Jerry's and Nike mm-hmm. and GE, when we studied Jack Welch, right? All those stories help us figure out what should we do next? Where's the next stop on our business, leadership, wealth, or success train? All right, and you you just said a few words in there that, of course, are throwing up. We can't, I can't believe we've gone this long and not talked about it, right? You mentioned Jack Welch, GE. So I I I went and used my Robinhood app and bought some GE stock right away for it, just, just sentimental. Yet we talked wealth, and we had a wealth series. And wow, what an event 
that was. Man, so, how much did that end up costing you, by the way? You gave away a bunch <laughs> of money at the end of that thing. We like, gave a lot of money away to kids and families and people that that really uh, took advantage and, and took the time to learn. And that was really that was the funnest money I ever gave away. It's nothing like giving it to the IRS. If I can just, that's no fun. Now that's hang on. That's episodes thirty eight through forty six. For those of you who want to go back, and we can dive into each one a little bit, or you could go to winmakegive.com slash wealth where you could find the Take wealth series. Yourself. Yeah. I, I had a conversation today out in the hallway, as, as often happens with Olivia, who runs um, is kind of a director of ops in one of your businesses. And she, I, she just recently bought a house. And so I was out there and I said, hey, I, hey congratulations on, on, you know, I saw on Facebook you bought your house and that's so awesome. And she said, well, it's, it's actually my second house. And I said, oh, fantastic. Did you keep the first one? And she's like, yeah. And, and we talked a little bit and I said, Olivia, like, Look, I don't know where you came from, right? I've only known you for the last year. Like be three years ago, would you have ever thought that this was the path that you would be on? And she said, honestly, I didn't think this like before the Wealth Series. She's like, my, my, my husband or my partner and I, we started doing this because of the Wealth Series, right? She went and bought that second house and has her first rental now. And, and she's somebody in our world that, that took this resource, this Wealth Series that we put out there. And we've seen a lot of people taking this thing, Chad, and yeah. and and reporting back to us the big wins, the the reduction in their debt, and and paying off credit cards, and um, I mean, just really, Ben. I think, you know, years from now, if there was any way that we could add it all up, I think that that those eight episodes will be one of your great contributions to to all of us, really. Let me run those episodes for us, right? We had, of course, the overview, and then we had a, a reality check where you talked about our, our net worth tracker and all of that. Uh, we had planning for retirement, and boy, thank God Bob was with us because the math started to show up in that planning for retirement. Then we got to save like crazy, student of wealth, where we were talking about compound interest, increase your income, which we've talked about on a few episodes, and I'll come back to that, pay less taxes legally, right? Oh. We all we'll make sure of that. <laughs> Uh, and invest wisely. And then we went a step farther and we threw in an episode we weren't even planning, which was your top 10 books on wealth, which actually ended up being 11 books, Ben. Yeah. What was your takeaway from the wealth series other than the impact of everybody just sharing how it was impacting them with that story Bob just shared? It was just filling our Facebook group uh, with people succeeding. But what was your impact from the wealth series or your takeaway? Well, what's funny is we also ended the wealth series with an interview of a guy named Steve Adcock. Yes. And Steve was a 31 year old computer programmer that decided that he didn't like the world as he knew it, corporate America. And he wanted to retire and he wanted to retire by, by 40 years old. So he put into place a plan, which is almost identical to the wealth series, right? cutting expenses, saving more, investing in the same places that we talked about. Yep. And he wasn't able to retire at 40. He was able to retire at about 35. Yeah. And it was a fascinating uh, interview if you check it out. It's episode 46. But what I loved about the Wealth Series is we gave people a roadmap and a plan to achieve wealth. Mm -hmm. And I always hated the word wealth because it feels like lifestyles that are rich and famous with Robin Leach, you know, something like that. So it, define it for us. It, the ability to do what we want, when we want, with who we want. Mm -hmm. That's freedom. Like paint your face blue, put on a kilt, ditch the underwear, right? This is Braveheart <laughs> and its spinums. Freedom! <laughs> hey, keep your underwear on. Come on. <laughs> You don't need underwear if you're free. In fact, <laughs> there's a whole phrase for that that I'm not going to say, right? But uh, Tom Petty made a song very close to it. <laughs> don't start singing. Let's, the let's the, the Wealth Theory was a simple roadmap into how do you get yourself into a position where financial freedom is actually attainable. And then at some point in the future, we'll release the investing series, which is not out yet, but you can... Sign up for it for free at winmakegive.com forward slash investing. Additionally, in the wealth series, I love that we all took the time to make the workbooks, mm -hmm. to make the workbooks and the homework and to give people the spreadsheets and the calculators that any one of our listeners can go back and, and take the wealth series, winmakegive.com forward slash wealth. And it's free, by the way. We're not trying to sell you any shit. You just get it and then you download it and you get the workbooks and you get the spreadsheets and you get the calculators and you get all the tools. Do it with your family, your friends, your neighbors, your employees, like just... Take this thing and implement it in your world, and it changes the conversation. Yeah, we, 
we came back to income recently. We talked about the uh, three types of income in episode 88. The, the subject came up again, and they were normal income, investment income, and passive income. Check that one out on episode 88 so you can hear it. Now, Bob, we had some great opportunities you and I did for some fantastic interviews. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And uh, one of my favorites, uh, and of course, it, it was completely personal. I used the podcast as an excuse to get to interview. And that was Joe DeSena, the CEO of, of Spartan, ah. uh, which ended up being a, a total blast, I think, as we went over it. He shared with us the seven pillars of Spartan and talked. The big takeaway for me was that that we, we train or practice adversity, right? He carries a, a kettlebell with him everywhere he goes so that when he's not carrying it, everything's easier. And he, and he talks about that. Uh, and you can go listen to our interview with Joe in episode 31. Tons of fun with him on his farm. I, I know you had something from that, but Bob, I wanted to ask you, because I think the interview that might have impacted you the most was when it got really confusing for you uh, for a second there. And on episode 57, you had Chad Himes and Chad Hymas with you. Yeah, I sure did. A and that episode really got you while we were doing that interview live. What do you remember from the conversations with Chad? Well, really quick before, I, I just want to make one comment on the Joe DeSena interview because the thing that stuck out to me the most from that interview is that you can actually go out and hire a Kung Fu master. Yeah. <laughs> this dude hired a Kung Fu master to come train his children. So that was amazing. Um, man, that, that Chad Hymas is a, a special individual. Like I, I'm almost getting choked up, like recalling that interview. He, he got me good, man. He hit my, my sweet spot. Like, um, look, yeah, I probably complained about something on the way out of my house this morning. Right. Like we all, you know, we give ourselves room to kind of do that. Right. To you know, this thing, or I'm a little bit down today. This guy just go listen to the interview. It's, it's amazing. He, 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 had a massive accident, right? Chad, like in his, in his, in his twenties, he'd lost like basically all functionality from his neck down. Yeah, quadriplegic. Uh, the guy has not let this stop him one bit. Uh, he, he's got a successful business and he's, he's, he, I mean, he biked from like Salt Lake city to Vegas. Yes. I mean, it's just the, the, and by the way, I, I, I don't know. He never did answer what his dad's profession was, but no. like, some of the wisdom that his father shared with him, uh, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was something along the lines of he's in the hospital, he's totally paralyzed, he's just told him, and his dad basically says to him, like, what are you going to be do to be different, right? That there's, there's other people that have come before you in this situation, like, how are you going to do something different? I mean, it's just, it was a really, really powerful interview. You know, I'm, again, it's one of these, like, I'm sad Ben missed out on it. We had a, a talk about elk, uh, the majestic <laughs> elk. Right. So yeah. episode 57, definitely one to check out on that interview. I know that I know that Dave had a favorite interview, right? We, we never talk about Dave. We don't let Dave on the mic. The guy behind the scenes. The guy the, who makes the us man, sound good. The right? myth, the legend. He edits out the shits, the, That's right. the dot bleeps. He, he like edits the, the pauses when we're thinking for like three minutes. So it <laughs> yeah. doesn't sound like it took uh, us that long to come up with the answer. We appreciate you, Dave. Yet when we were thinking about all the episodes, one of the ones that Dave actually threw at me was, Episode 87, when we were talking with Randy Ross, and he remembered that Randy said, tough times reveal what good times conceal. And that one really stuck with Dave. So I love the fact that he might have to listen to the episode because he has to, yet there's always an aha you're finding in those episodes. What, what now, was the next one for you, Ben? You, know, you guys got to interview uh, lots of people, many of which are people that matter to me and I care about. Uh, you guys l interviewed Brian Gubernick when he talked about how do you retain talent? And he did a follow-up episode for us on how do you evaluate business? And then after that, you, you interviewed my very first hire and my, and my partner in many things, uh, Jalene Snell, to talk about health. Yep. And it was just special to hear you both interview people that mean so much to me. What were your takeaways from Brian or Jalene? Bob, you stole the the show with Brian. I did. You, I kicked you guys, you guys out of the room. Locked I locked us the out door. of the room and recorded. That's right. I, I think one of the... The takeaways from Brian is he has a he has a process and and a process is something that is threaded throughout the entire Win Make Give podcast. I think this idea of of being better than we could have ever been because we have a process, right? Systems and, make the ordinary yeah. extraordinary, kind yep. of thing. There it is. And Brian shared his process for evaluating investment opportunities, and I thought 
man, I bet a lot of people just take every investment opportunity and kind of try to evaluate it on its merits. And there's no consistency in how you evaluate those things. And when you realize that every time you put your money somewhere, there's a potential opportunity cost associated with that, some other place you could not invest your money. I think that normalizing that, normalizing the way that you investigate where you want to put your money is, I mean, it was, it was a really great episode from Brian and he's a, he's a really sharp guy the, the my problem when, when it's Brian and I is we both get a little bit amped up. So <laughs> we need Ben's like easy, you know, easy, calm nature to, to, to level us out. But I, I think that, um, that Brian shared some really, really good stuff. And that was episode 81 and episode 83 where you took over with, with Brian. I had the pleasure of sitting with Jolene in episode 89 where we talked health. And for those of you who are taking notes, 89 for that episode, you can always go to winmakegive.com and you can easily find every single one of our episodes there if you don't want to go through wherever you're getting your podcast to find these. The, the takeaway for Jolene was just start today. Right? I mean, that was the one thing that came out of that conversation we were having about health was it just start today, whatever it is you're going to be, whether it's getting on a bike, whether it's running, whether it's just walking with some weight, whether it's changing what you're eating, whether it's whatever it is, just start because it doesn't need to be a big thing Chad, to get it going. if I might add, quickly add, just start today with athletic socks. Yes, absolutely. Like blisters will get blisters you Blisters will break you. Now, one of the things I've noticed about all of these, whether it's talking to Brian, talking to Jolene, just us talking about things is, you mentioned it already that Sam just asked a question. And we did a whole episode based on asking better questions way back in episode 25. Bob, what do you remember when we talked about that conversation? So I think this, you know, there's a hundred episodes. I'm pretty sure the baseline of this episode was the book, The Seven Powers of Questions, if I'm not mistaken. And Ben had had us read that book. That is one of probably the most consequential books I've ever read in my professional career. Like when you start to realize how, and Ben is a, ma I, you've trained yourself to be a master at this, I think, but questions are massively powerful. And I think that they are also massively underutilized. Most of the, the leadership styles that you would see are very rarely coming from this kind of questioning perspective, right? They're like giving orders. They're, they're telling what you should do. And one of the things I love about Ben's leadership style is there's a lot of questions because the reality is, and I think we talked about this in the episode, you don't always know the answers, right, Ben? You don't always know the answer when I come to you and go, hey, man, like, I need help. Like, you just know how to ask the questions to get to the answer. So that was a, I love that episode. And it's something that I'm constantly thinking about when I'm working with a, a team or I'm coaching or training somebody is, what, what question can I ask that's going to help them kind of self-discover, that's going to help them find the answer? Because when you go find your own, if somebody gives you the answer, Chad, you're not going to be as bought in as if you go and find that answer yourself. And the power, you know, asking better questions can, can really change your, your leadership skills. Yeah, it's not a skill set that you wake up and say, great, look at that person. They're, they're an amazing, they're born an amazing question asker, right? Question asker. It's a, it's a skill. It requires listening, right? And it requires spending the time to figure out how to ask the best question and the best follow-up question and to dig deeper and deeper and be willing to chase, chase a rabbit if, if you see one or you see signs of one, right? Mm -hmm. And it was an impactful episode for, for me as well, Bob. You know, Bob, watching you while we're recording these, sometimes, and you've said it on a few of the episodes, you get lost in the episode almost like a listener. Yeah. Right? The interview with Chad Hymas, some of the conversations that we'll be having with Ben, you'll just be like, oh, right, it's finally clicking or getting it. <laughs> I got to say, and I don't remember what episode number it was in, and it was driving me crazy as I was putting together some of these ideas. Um, when Ben talked about planning and how he doesn't really plan for the far future, he plans for short term and what's coming because you really have no idea what five years from now holds for you, what three years from now holds from you, even what one year, yet you could probably plan the next quarter and have your target and where you think you're going to go. And that was 
huge for me. I mean, I've known Ben for a long time. And I remember when he said that in the episode, like my jaw hit the table. Yeah. I was shocked. What's one thing that just stands out to you? You might not even remember what episode it came out of, but what was one thing that you just remember hearing and going, wow, I've just never heard that from him before, it seems. I've heard a lot from Ben. I think <laughs> Unfortunately, Bob's, Bob's been in more classes. He doesn't necessarily <laughs> listen, though, all I've the heard, time. I've heard so. a lot. But here's the thing. I think that for any of us, um, we are ready. We, we are ready to receive the message when we're ready to receive the message, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I might be a, just a, a a bonehead. I might have a thick skull. Some of these messages I've heard three or four times, and it's the the fifth time that I get the message, right? So that'd be the first thing that I'd say. So, I think for me, the the one that. I, I, I'm a math, like I was on the math team in high school. I'm, I'm required to say that, by the way, anytime I bring up the word math, but uh, the, <laughs> compound, the compound interest stuff inside of the well series to me was equal parts amazing and heart, heart wrenching, right? To think yep. that like what I did in my 20s and if I'd just been sticking 100 bucks a month or what, you know, that, that compound interest discussion, our, and we talked about it back then, your brain can't even wrap around what, what, the compound interest really means. Right. And, and so, and then when you start to, and look, this again is a kind of a common thread throughout the, throughout the podcast. It's not just with your money, right? It's with your skills. It's with your education. It's with your learning. It's, it's with your relationships. Like the compounding effect of, of consistency is, is massive. And so I, to me, that was one of the biggest ahas and it's almost embarrassing to say, right? Because I, I do consider myself pretty proficient in math. And these are really just like mathematical equations. But until you see those numbers, like in the well series, and you're looking at those spreadsheets and you're realizing what an extra 10 or 20 years of having had that money there means, your brain can't really wrap around it. Yeah, the example we gave in that episode of the three of us, if we had started investing, I think it was at 20 and at 30 and at 40. Yeah. What a difference that made. All right, so as we're getting near the end of this look back on some great episodes. Thank God. <laughs> I want you to remember, you know, if Ben was watching you today, would, you, would he be impressed or would he be depressed? Right, that's come up a few times in our episodes as well. Little thing I've learned, I've learned that, you know, you gotta be careful what you say around Bob and Ben because they're gonna start singing. <laughs> that, that's just one thing I've learned over the last hundred episodes. What about you, Ben? Oh, baby, you. <laughs> there it is. There you it is. got what I need. Oh, gosh. What you say? He Right? Stop. You know what the gift of uh, doing a podcast is, which has nothing to do with our listeners? It forces us to become better students. Mm -hmm. And I ask myself the question when we record a podcast, what value are we going to bring to our people? That's a good leadership lesson. As you're going into your office or your business or your, or your family or whatever, what new value are you going to bring to your people today? Because as you continue to bring value, they'll continue to look to you and, and ask from you uh, knowledge, information, and direction, and coaching, and mentorship. And that's powerful. I appreciate all the people that took the time to listen to season one of, of the Win, Make, Give podcast. What? Season one? Whoops. <laughs> and I especially appreciate you if you took the time to leave us a really heartfelt, honest review. So if you enjoyed any of our episodes and it was a value, you took any of our series, do me an honest promise favor. If you got this far in the podcast, just write a little review, go to Apple, wherever you listen and just write a little review and give us a rating, put your name in there. Maybe we'll pick something out for a cool prize or a cool surprise for any of you that do that. That would mean the world to us. And that's all we ask for return. What you notice is you just got 100 episodes of the Win Make Give podcast with no sales pitch, no coaching upgrade, no free box of DVDs, no advertising, no buy this, no 17 minute long, you should subscribe to Zip Recruiter or whatever the new thing <laughs> is. Like they just got an ad right there, but I they did not pay for that one. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was just a gift. So I hope you enjoyed the first Win Make Give podcast series one 
with our friends Chad Himes, who is here loyally every week, and Bob Stewart and the guy behind the scenes, uh, Mr. Dave Weldon. And there's a big team of people behind the Win Make Give podcast. Uh, Mikey Farina, who who markets our podcast out every week, and Josiah, who does the designs, and his team who worked on our our websites, and all the other people that put up with our crap while we're gone for half a day every single week to deliver more and more content. Nobody would have thought that we were going to roll three episodes a week for the entire year. I, think, I don't think we thought I don't think that. we believed it. I think COVID <laughs> helped with that a little bit. Yes. We're all locked at home going <laughs> <No> crazy. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned it, Ben. Season one. We're putting an end on season one for you. Folks, season two's coming. Don't worry about it. Stay tuned. We're going to bring you a lot more about that. And until season two, remember, wash those hands. And as always, do good. <laughs>